Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's um, inaugural lecture. For those who don't know me, I'm Mark Elliott. I'm the uh, faculty chair. Um, and to my right, uh, of course, is our speaker this evening, Professor Lionel Smith. Lionel took up the Downing Professorship of the Laws of England um, earlier this academic year in October, um, and we're delighted that he uh, is part of our faculty uh, now. Uh, the Downing Chair was established in 1800 through a bequest from Sir George Downing, who founded Downing College. The chair has recently been held by, among others, Professor Sir John Baker, who is with us this evening, and Professor Dame Sarah Worthington, who I know would have liked to be here today, um, but has um, uh, family uh, commitments um, elsewhere. Um, so Lionel is the latest in a long line of distinguished um, academics to hold um, this post. And as you will know, um, Lionel moved to Cambridge from uh, McGill, where he held the Sir William C. Macdonald chair, having previously taught at Alberta and um, Oxford. But we like to claim him, I think, as one of our own. We see him as having returned to his intellectual home as a former Cambridge LLM student. Um, and we're delighted that he's going to speak to us tonight um, re-establishing in the faculty a tradition of inaugural uh, lectures. So thank you very much, Lionel, for agreeing to do that, and we look forward to hearing from you on the topic of private laws to bodies. Colleagues, friends, students, guests, thank you very much for being here this evening. Your presence does me honor, and thanks to Mark Elliott, uh, not only for his most generous introduction, but for all the kindness that he's shown me since I joined the faculty last autumn. It is, of course, a tremendous honor for me to take up the Downing Professorship, and a challenge also. To be appointed to this position is to accept as a kind of steward a position in the university that, as Mark said, reaches back to 1800. I will speak tonight of private law's two bodies, but mine is the 15th body to sit in this metaphorical chair. Uh, the first Downing professor was Edward Christian, whose brother, as you may know, was more famous than Edward. The brother's name was Fletcher Christian. To take up the stewardship of this office is to accept the humbling challenge of producing legal scholarship that can be worthy of the accomplishments of one's predecessors. Over those 223 years, these predecessors have worked in both private law and public law, some, like the extraordinary historian Frederick Maitland, in both. Although I am primarily a private lawyer, I will aim this evening to say a little bit about public law as well. My title, however, may seem puzzling. It will make many of you think of the lectures and the book of another distinguished legal historian and holder of the Downing Chair, Sir John Baker, uh, that were entitled The Laws to Bodies. My argument will be that an important part of private law is governed by principles that we do not see in the law of contract or tort or restitution. What we are used to seeing in private law is that we act for ourselves and pursue our own ends. And so long as we do not infringe the rights of others, we are free so to act. But this is not always true. It is not true when we act for others in the sense that I will describe. When we so act, a whole system of principles is activated, a system that has a conceptual unity generated by that very consideration that we are not acting for ourselves. In private law, this is the domain of the fiduciary relationship. Moreover, I will also suggest that the importance of these principles goes well beyond private law. They apply also to holders of public powers who in the use of those powers necessarily do not act for themselves. Recent years have seen numerous examples of holders of very significant public powers who have considered themselves unbound by these principles. This raises two very important questions. The first is whether and to what extent these principles are implemented in the law. The second is, if they are not, whether they should be 
And the reason this is important is that many holders of public power seem increasingly to take the view that they are not bound by convention and tradition, but only by law. This trend compels us also to be sure that we understand the logic of these principles, what they aim to achieve, and the unifying concept that underlies all of them. My lecture will be in four main parts. First, the background. I will aim to describe what I think has gone wrong over the last 50 years in scholarship relating to fiduciary relationships. In the next and longest part, I will lay out my understanding of the key principles that apply when we act for others, but not when we act for ourselves. And we'll aim to convince you that the best way to understand them is as part of a coherent and unified whole. Finally, I will say a few words about the manifestations in public law of these principles and what this teaches us about the law as a whole. In developing these ideas, I have, of course, incurred many intellectual debts. I generated, during the course of this week, a list of my creditors in relation to these debts, uh, but it was too long. So I confined myself to those who have retired. That was the easiest way to cut it back. Ernest Weinerb's 1975 article on fiduciary relationships is still important. My former colleague at McGill, Madeleine Quentin Cummin, saw more than 25 years ago that private law has two bodies. And Paul Finn, whose name will come up many times in my lecture, was a pioneer in seeing that acting for others itself has two bodies appearing in both public law and private law. I turn then to the background. In the common law tradition, a number of legal doctrines were developed to regulate relationships of unequal power. Many of these were developed in chancery, and they were not always labeled and categorized as they are today. I should interject here that my argument is intended to be one that works in the civil law as well as in the common law. In a sense, as a comparative lawyer, I have two bodies of my own. For this reason, my argument does not rely on what might be called equity exceptionalism, although I assure you that I am acutely aware of how much of the law that I'm discussing comes in this legal tradition from equity. The Court of Chancery developed a number of legal tools and doctrines that were, for, that were for a time united under the label of fiduciary relationships, but which in today's law we consider distinct. And it seems to me that part of the development of the law has been driven by that, since the evolution of our thinking in the last 50 years has to some extent been in the direction of pulling these things apart. As late as 1998, writing extrajudicially, Peter Millett said that there were three distinct categories of fiduciary relationship. Relationships of trust and confidence, relationships of undue influence, and relationships of confidentiality. His point was to insist on their differences. And it is not surprising that he said, and I quote, the search for a single all-embracing definition is doomed to failure. I'm not sure anyone today would attempt such a definition because the current consensus is that the fiduciary relationship, what he called the relationship of trust and confidence, stands quite apart from the law on undue influence and the law on the protection of confidential information. But the point is that it is hardly surprising that we find famous statements in 20th century cases, such as Re Coomber in 1911, warning us that there is no unity to fiduciary relationships, nor that when scholars like Len Seeley in the 1960s and Paul Finn in the 1970s tried to make sense of the law of fiduciary relationships, they could not see an overarching unity. But the reaction to this was unfortunate. In the taxonomy of logical errors, I think it falls under the category known as throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
Finn's famous 1977 monograph, Fiduciary Obligations, has been described as the book most stolen from the Squire Law Library. And I note that there is not a copy in the collection except of the 40th anniversary reprint. And I hasten to add that the only copy I have is my own copy of the 40th anniversary <laughs> reprint. On page one of that book, Finn said that one conclusion of his labors was that it is meaningless to talk of fiduciary relationships as such. This may have been an item on the rather short list of things on which Peter Burks agreed with Paul Finn. <laughs> and in his important 2010 study, uh, Matthew Coniglen says the same thing. It is time to put Humpty Dumpty together again. Although the label fiduciary relationship, as it was inherited from the cases of the 18th and 19th centuries, did contain too much to be a conceptual unity, it was an overreaction to conclude that there was no there there. Paul Finn himself said so in 2014. Today, in line with his later views, I will argue that fiduciary duties cannot be understood except through an understanding of the fiduciary relationship. In another well-known contribution of 1989, Finn argued that the rules about unauthorized profits and about conflicts are the only duties properly called fiduciary duties. This minimalist view was soon adopted by the High Court of Australia, and Matthew Coniglen's analysis attempts to defend this position. This view attracted other scholars, including, I may add, a younger version of myself, but for several reasons, I now believe that it's a mistake to think that the label fiduciary duty refers only to these rules. One reason is that if one cuts fiduciary duties back that far, one is left with an impossible task. What explanation can there be for saddling some people, but not everyone, with these peculiar duties? This is exactly what Sir Anthony Mason meant when he famously said in 1985, and I quote, the fiduciary relationship is a concept in search of a principle. The minimalist approach went too far because it failed to see that acting for others attracts different legal principles from acting for oneself. It took these two rules and tried to explain them with the same principles that we would use to explain contractual or tortious duties. It also failed to see that the phrase fiduciary duty need no more speak to the content of a duty, then do the phrases contractual duty or parental duty. These phrases speak rather to the source of the duty. Contractual relationships and parental relationships are the sources of a range of duties, some prescriptive and some proscriptive, some voluntary in the strictest sense and some not. That is also true of fiduciary relationships. A fiduciary relationship is a relationship that presumptively activates the rules about profits and conflicts, but other rules and duties as well. And it activates all of them because all of them are aspects of what a fiduciary relationship is. It is a relationship in which one person is entrusted with powers to equip them to act for and on behalf of another person or for the achievement of some other regarding purpose. That is the unity, and the failure to see the unity led to the failure to articulate the principle that Sir Anthony Mason sought. The failure to see the unity was caused by the unstated or perhaps unrecognized assumption that we always act in law, at least in private law, for ourselves. On the contrary, the fiduciary relationship, the relationship in which we act for others, is a vitally important concept in our law. And not only in our law, but in the civil law as well, albeit not always traveling under that name. So this is the case that I will try to make. First, private law has two bodies, because different legal principles apply when you act for others than when you act for yourself. Secondly, that all those principles, which are implemented by rules of law, are nothing more nor less than the implementation of different aspects of a relationship in which you are acting for others. And thirdly, building here also on Finn's work, 
that understanding this helps us to better understand the important links between private fiduciary law and the legal principles that govern those who hold public powers, because those people also hold powers that equip them to perform an other regarding mission. What then are these special legal principles that apply to those acting for others but do not apply to those acting for themselves? I will mention four, although I think there are others. These are the heart of the matter. The first can be described as the proper purposes doctrine. The first sentence of the advice of the Privy Council given last December in the Grandview Trust case reads, it is a fundamental principle of equity that a fiduciary power may be exercised only for a purpose for which the power has been conferred. This is a cornerstone of acting for others. A power held for others is not like money in your pocket. You can do as you wish with the money in your pocket. And so you can, usually, with purely contractual powers, like a landlord's power to terminate a lease. There may be some implied contractual restrictions against the abusive use of contractual powers. These are for extreme cases, recognizable to a civilian as implementations of good faith, rarer, but certainly not unknown in the common law. But with fiduciary powers, it is fundamental and systematic that the power can only be used in the pursuit of the other regarding mission for which it was granted. A discretionary power necessarily involves the exercise of judgment and reasoning. The proper purposes doctrine makes justiciable the fiduciary's subjective process of reasoning, looking at what that person was trying to accomplish and why, and comparing these objectives to the purpose for which they were entrusted with the power in the first place. This process is not typical in private law adjudication. The Grandview Trust case is the latest in a series of recent Supreme Court and Privy Council cases that address the proper exercise of fiduciary powers as part of the law of fiduciary relationships, so extending a tradition that reaches back to the 18th century. In none of these recent cases was there any suggestion of either a conflict of interest or an unauthorized profit. At least in this jurisdiction, it seems to me that the argument that the only fiduciary duties are the rules about conflicts and profits cannot be said to be consistent with the positive law. In fact, the proper purposes doctrine is not about fiduciary duties in the strictest sense, but about legal rules governing the proper exercise of fiduciary powers. H.L.A. Hart taught us that not every legal rule imposes a duty. It is interesting, at least to me, to see that in Grandview Trust, the Privy Council twice referred to the duties and restrictions that apply to fiduciaries in relation to their fiduciary powers. I turn then to the rules about conflicts. They are also rules governing the proper exercise of fiduciary powers, and they can be linked directly to the proper purposes doctrine. <coughs> the trouble with conflicts, whether conflicts of self-interest and duty or conflicts of duty and duty, is that they make it impossible to know whether an improper purpose has affected the fiduciary's exercise of judgment. Impossible, I will argue, even for the fiduciary to know let alone anyone else. This is not a problem that can be solved by evidence of even the most honest kind. In 1894, an English judge, Lord Justice Archibald Smith, no relation, expressed the matter in this way in a case called re Lamb, using the gender-specific language of his day. It is obvious, everybody knows it, who has any knowledge of life, that when a man has a pecuniary interest, his mind is naturally warped in favor of his own interest. It is human nature and no one can doubt it. It is very important to say that this is not about corruption. Those who are corrupt do not care about being in conflicts. 
The difficulty, the challenge, is to understand why these rules apply so strictly to people who are in perfect good faith. One reason this is so important is that we see again and again that when the question is raised whether someone is in a conflict of interest, that person often thinks that their integrity is being challenged. This is wrong. Lord Justice Smith was not saying everyone is corrupt. He was saying that self-interest has potential effects on the human reasoning process whose actual incidence is unknowable, even by the person doing the reasoning. Over a century later, there's a body of psychological research that shows that he was right. People cannot avoid the possibility of being influenced by their self-interest even when they make a conscious and good faith effort to do so. And they cannot reliably know whether they have been so influenced. One serious problem in the fiduciary literature is the failure to define and explain exactly what we mean by a conflict of interest in this context. I suspect that many authors think that the expression refers simply to a conflict between the interests of the fiduciary and the interests of the beneficiary. In 2013, the French civilian Rémy Cabriac observed, however, that every rule of private law exists to regulate conflicts of that kind. This is the function of the rules governing contract formation, of tort law, of the law of damages, of family law, everything. And even in a fiduciary relationship, there's nothing inherently problematic about a conflict between the interests of the fiduciary and those of the beneficiary. Because they each have separate interests, almost every aspect of their relationship is characterized by that kind of conflict from beginning to end. The moment a trustee is appointed, we could say that it would be better for the beneficiaries if the trustee worked 24 hours a day on their behalf, or at least 18 if we wanted the trustee to get some sleep. That describes an interest of the beneficiaries, maximal effort from the trustee. <coughs> Since being a trustee is not, in principle, a full-time job and indeed is often unpaid, it is obvious that the trustee, excuse me, the trustee's interest is to work less than 18 hours a day. That conflict between their respective interests is clearly not what we mean when we refer to the fiduciary rules on conflicts. There are legal rules to resolve that conflict of interests, as one ethicist calls it, but they are different rules. When we look more widely at discussions of ethics, including legal ethics, but also the ethics of journalists, politicians, judges, and even law professors, we get a much better definition. A conflict of self-interest and duty arises where one's self-interest conflicts with the duty that one has to exercise judgment in an unselfish or other regarding fashion. That is why you should not sit on the scholarship committee if your niece is a candidate. This is not a deterrent rule. It is a rule about protecting the proper exercise of duty-bound judgment. The concern is not with conflicts between interests as such. It is, as the High Court of Australia has said, with a conflict between the fiduciary self-interest and the duties that they are under in respect of their fiduciary powers. This is why these rules only apply to people who hold fiduciary powers. Those powers must be exercised in what the fiduciary perceives to be the best interests of the beneficiary, speaking generally, and a competing self-interest is liable, as I've said, to have an unknowable effect on the fiduci fiduciary's exercise of this duty-bound judgment. This more precise definition gives us a workable rule. A fiduciary should not exercise her fiduciary power when her self-interest is liable to affect her exercise of judgment. Again, this is a rule about the proper exercise of fiduciary powers, and its justification as a rule is clear enough, since it exists precisely to address a fact which, 
according at least to Lord Justice Archibald Smith, everyone knows. Moreover, we see in the positive law that an infringement of the rule leads to the voidability of the exercise of the power, just like a proven improper purpose. The unknowable possibility that such a purpose interfered with the fiduciary's judgment and reasoning process creates the very same result in law. So when they're given their proper scope, the rules about conflicts exist precisely to support the rules about proper purposes. All of them, as well as the rules about so-called inadequate deliberation, are rules about the proper exercise of fiduciary powers. Let us turn then to the rule against unauthorized profits. This, in my view, has generated the most confusion. And the confusion has arisen precisely out of failing to see that acting for others attracts different principles from acting for oneself. When we look at these cases about unauthorized profits, we see a defendant who is required to give up some profit that is, has accrued to him through acting in the fiduciary role. When we are acting for ourselves, we are free to act as we wish, so long as we don't do anything unlawful. So if you start from the position that everyone always acts for themselves, and you see a fiduciary who is required to give up a gain, you naturally draw the inference that they must have done something unlawful to merit this sanction. And here too, we may think of corruption. There is an article in today's New York Times that was prompted by recent news from the Supreme Court of the United States. It is written by a former federal corruption prosecutor. And not surprisingly, it is all in terms of corruption. And some unauthorized profits are indeed corrupt. But in a way, corruption is easy. The most striking thing about fiduciaries is they have to give up gains that were acquired in perfectly good faith and without causing any harm or loss to the beneficiary. In the light of that, what could be the wrongful act in this context? There are almost as many answers as there are authors. Some say it is harm, some say the risk of harm. Some say it is misappropriation and some the risk of it. Some say it is opportunism, which some describe as misappropriation and others describe as undefinable. But we know from the law that we do not need any legal wrong to generate accountability for profit. So looking for a wrong seems wrong. Some say that the wrong is being in a conflict. But it is clear that accountability does not depend on the existence of a conflict in my narrow sense, which I described earlier, and which only comes into play in the context of the exercise of fiduciary powers. If we reject my narrow definition of conflict and say that it is wrong to be in any situation where the interests of the fiduciary are in conflict with the interests of the beneficiary, the trouble is, as I have explained, that this is all the time. So it is not a good candidate for a legal wrong, and indeed it seems to be just another way of saying that no wrong is needed. No wrong is needed. That is my claim. The duty to surrender profits acquired in the course of acting in a fiduciary capacity does not arise from any unlawful act, but only from the fiduciary role. If the accountability of a fiduciary for an unauthorized gain were a remedy for a wrongful act, then as a matter of logic, it would be open to the fiduciary to show that there was no causal link between the wrong and the gain, just as defendants in tort may try to show this to avoid responsibility for a loss. And as the wrong-based logic in this part of fiduciary law has gained an, uh, prominence, some defendants have indeed tried this argument. They have not been successful. The limiting constraint is that the gain must have been acquired through acting in the fiduciary role. If it was, then there is accountability, even if the defendant could show that he could have made the gain otherwise. Thus, 
The fiduciary's accountability for an unauthorized gain is not a remedy for a wrong, but a primary duty arising from the fiduciary relationship. There is not only no need to link it to any wrong, there is no need to link it to conflicts, which have their own logic relating, as we have seen, to the exercise of fiduciary powers. Accountability arises from the mere consideration that when one is acting in such a relationship, one is acting by definition for and on behalf of another. What one extracts is attributed by the law to that other, and this is given effect by accountability. There is no great mystery if one thinks of the fiduciary's presumptive right to recover expenses that have been properly incurred by acting in the fiduciary role. No one says that this right depends on any wrong by the beneficiary. It arises simply because of how the fiduciary was acting. In his treatise on the Belgian law of mandate, Henri de Page discussed the mandatary's duty to account to the mandator for everything the mandatory received as a result of the mandate. This principle is found in a well-known text in the Digest of Justinian attributed to Paul, and so it is not surprising that versions of this rule against unauthorized profits are found throughout the continental tradition. Depage, whose treatise was later updated by René Deckers, said that the mandate can never be a source of profit for the mandatory apart from the mandatory's authorized compensation. Why not? Lorsqu'il exécute son mandat, le mandataire est le mandant. Il ne lui est pas permis d'être à la fois le mandant et lui-même, au détriment de celui qu'il a chargé de le représenter. My liberal translation... When he is carrying out the mandate, the agent is the principal. He is not allowed to be the principal and himself at the same time, to the detriment of the one who has entrusted him as a representative. Now, you might dismiss this slightly mystical formulation as the kind of thing that may please continental philosophers, but does not belong in the robust tradition of the individualistic common law. The agent is not literally the principal. So let me add a more recent quotation from Lord Justice Robin Jacob, writing for a unanimous court of appeal, although we might think that his gender-specific language is a little less easy to understand since he was writing in 2009. If you undertake to act for a man, you must act 100% body and soul for him. You must act as if you were him. That almost sounds like a wedding vow. <laughs> you must act 100% body and soul for another. It seems to me that that explains the rule against unauthorized profits without the need to rely on any breach of duty. You must act as if you were him. So the money you extract is his money. In both quotations, we see a powerful metaphor these two people, the metaphor says, are not really two, at least in law. They are two bodies, but they are both acting as one. I think it is a good illustration of how the legal principles that apply in these relationships are not the ones we are used to in contract, in tort, in the law of restitution. And indeed, Lord Justice Jacob referred not only to the body, but to the soul I wonder whether he meant there to allude to the proper purposes principle, that when you act for others, your very subjective purposes, your innermost thoughts, are justiciable. This brings me to the final principle that I will state in relation to these situations. In these other regarding relationships, the fiduciary is entrusted with powers to act for another or for a purpose. At one level, those powers belong to them alone. These powers are usually discretionary, and the law does not give a single answer as to how they are to be exercised. In relation to trust law, the courts speak of the non-intervention principle, and in company law, we may hear of the business judgment rule, 
These are merely jurisdictional principles. It is the fiduciary who must exercise their own judgment in relation to their powers. But just as the power belongs to the fiduciary, paradoxically, it does not. It does not belong to her the way her power to sell her house belongs to her. A fiduciary power can always be taken away, although the details vary from one context to another. The precarity of the role is built into it, and that is also part of what it means to act for others, not for yourself. I stop there. There are, of course, not the whole lecture, that part of the lecture. <laughs> there are, of course, other important aspects of fiduciary relationships. Some of them are genuine duties, for example, duties to produce information, and the breach of these duties may sound in damages. But the four that I outline give us the basic picture. Two of them, proper purposes and the rules about conflicts properly understood, are about the proper exercise of fiduciary powers. Fiduciary powers are thus rightly at the heart of acting for and on behalf of another because it is the powers that equip you so to act in law. Accountability for unauthorized profits grows directly out of the bare fact that one has been entrusted with the role of acting for another. Nothing more is needed. So private law's two bodies are deeply different from one another. <coughs> Unconstrained legal powers are very different from powers that can only be exercised for the benefit of others and can never be unimpeachably used when one's own interests are in play. Acting for oneself means freedom to pursue one's own self-interest as one best sees fit within the limits of the law. Acting for others means other regarding duty and accountability throughout. Acting for oneself means security in the ability to enjoy one's rights and powers. Acting for others means the always looming possibility of removal from one's role. I turn now to the final part of the lecture in which I aim to say something about another project of Paul Finn's, that is, thinking about what all this tells us about powers held for public purposes. Finn argued that fiduciary principles are found also in public law. In this, I think he was quite right. Let me run quickly through the four principles that I've already discussed. Public powers can only be used, can only be rightly used, in the pursuit of the purposes for which they were granted. This is clear in many leading cases that I need not recite. Can public powers be unimpeachably exercised while the holder is in a conflict of self-interest and duty? The detail depends on the context, but it is clear that the powers of judges cannot be, as the Pinochet affair reminds us. A judgment given, a judgment of a court given in a conflict of interest and duty is just as voidable as the exercise of a fiduciary power while in a conflict. Does the rule about unauthorized profits apply to those who exercise public powers? Again, the details vary by context. But we certainly find it applying in some contexts, illustrated by cases like Attorney General for Hong Kong against Reed in 1994, which far from being an outlier, is only the latest in a case in a line that reaches back at least to Attorney General against Edmonds, which was decided in the Court of Chancery before the Judicature Act reforms in 1868. The rule would certainly apply to charity trustees, and it has also been applied at the level of the Privy Council to elected members of local governments. In a 2005 Canadian case, the rule against unauthorized profits was applied to a driving license examiner who had extracted $175,000 in bribes to issue such licenses without the inconvenience of a road test. <laughs> and turning to the fourth principle, Holders of public powers can always be relieved of them in one way or another, at least in a democracy. It is not surprising that many scholars and not a few courts have commented on the similarity between the principles that regulate acting for others in private law 
and those that regulate acting for others in public law. But the similarities, but if the similarities are too obvious to ignore, the differences should not be minimized either. Both courts and commentators have insisted on these differences, sometimes in a technical voice and sometimes more amusingly. The House of Lords and the Supreme Court of Canada have both said that a holder of public powers is not properly called a fiduciary, confining in that way the word fiduciary, to private law relationships. Len Seeley was of the same view, and so too is my predecessor in the Downing Chair, Dame Sarah Worthington. Timothy Endicott, in a paper that was critical of fiduciary theories of public powers, reacted to the claims of similarity with the comment, I quote, everything, after all, is somewhat like everything else. (laughs) Let me focus on two of these differences, which have been of of particular interest to me as a beginner in public law, who has only come to it, leaving aside my undergraduate education many years ago, quite recently and with the eyes of a private lawyer. Indeed, as a colleague has remarked, with the eyes of a trust lawyer. First, speaking generally, in private law, a fiduciary is charged with protecting the interests of private persons. And to the extent that she holds discretionary powers, is to be guided in their use by her evaluation of the best interests of those persons. As Lord Sales remarked in his Freshfields lecture earlier this year, building on the judgment of the House of Lords in the 1988 Tower Hamlets case and on Don Oliver's important 1999 study, Common Values and the Private-Public Divide, Public bodies do not have interests of their own. They can only lawfully act in the furtherance of the public interest, although what that means can be widely variable in different contexts. So public powers are always rightly exercised for the pursuit or advancement of a purpose, not for the interests of persons. In the widest case, for the benefit of the public at large, in other cases, for a more narrowly defined public interest. The second difference is the nature of the duties under which the power holder acts. In private administration, the duties of the administrator are owed to the person or persons who are the beneficiaries of the administration we see a bilateral correlative relationship that is characteristic of private law, discussed analytically by Wesley Hofeld and prioritized theoretically as the essence of private law by Ernest Weinrib. When a private lawyer tries to understand public law, it can be a challenge. Whether the reverse is true, I leave to another lecturer. But this is because the correlative right-duty relationship that is characteristic of private law is not found in public administration. In Swain Against the Law Society in the House of Lords in 1983, Lord Brightman said, I quote, the nature of a public duty and the remedies of those who seek to challenge the manner in which it is performed differ markedly from the nature of a private duty and the remedies of those who say that the private duty has been breached. If a public duty is breached, there is the remedy of judicial review. There is no remedy in breach of trust or equitable account. The duty imposed on the possessor of a statutory power for public purposes is not accurately described as fiduciary because there is no beneficiary in the equitable sense. Now, a duty that can be enforced through judicial review or in some other public law way is, of course, a legal duty. It is probably what H.L.A. Hart called an undirected duty, a duty which does not correspond to a claim right in the strict sense of that term elucidated by Hofeld. When we seek to understand how acting for others is regulated in public law, this, it seems to me, is the greatest difference. As Lord Brightman said, the different form of the duty, its undirected form, plays out in its different enforcement. 
If we take the case of charity trustees, who as the administrators of a charity must act in the public interest and for the public benefit, we see that these public administrators have legal duties that correspond exactly to the principles that I've discussed above. But they do not have beneficiaries as trustees of private trusts do. So how are these undirected duties enforced? In fact, there are several possibilities. The Attorney General holds a power of enforcement as a law officer of the Crown. Private citizens can, at least in theory, bring something called a relator action in which they are given permission to take over the Attorney General's enforcement role. In this jurisdiction, there is, of course, the Charity Commission, a non-ministerial government department accountable directly to Parliament which can enforce these duties of charity trustees. And under the old law and now under statute, interested members of the public may have standing to enforce those undirected duties just as they may be able to enforce such duties in other contexts through judicial review. Thus, even though an undirected duty does not correspond to a, rel to a correlative claim right, it is an enforceable legal duty. I mention in passing that this concept of an undirected duty may be helpful in the analysis of non-charitable purpose trusts, well known in various island jurisdictions, uh, and now appearing in the United States and perhaps soon in Scotland. But this important difference as between private powers and public powers in the form of the legal duties owed by power holders should not hide the similarities in the content of those duties, nor should it hide the similarities in their justifications. The justificatory principles that underlie the positive legal rules are the same in public law as the ones that I described earlier in relation to private law. I pass to my brief conclusion. Private law has two bodies, the domain of acting for ourselves and the domain of acting for others, each one with its distinctive principles. But the domain of acting for others is itself also dual. It cuts across the boundary between private law and public law even while the relevant principles are implemented differently, and even while the enforcement of the relative duties plays out differently. Often, when trust lawyers like myself look at some aspects of public law, and we see the judicial review of the exercise of powers for improper purposes, we may say to ourselves, this is just like fiduciary law. In the Tower Hamlets case that I mentioned earlier, Lord Bridge quoted a statement of Professor William Wade, which I in turn quote, statutory power conferred for public purposes is conferred as it were upon trust, not absolutely, end of quotation. And yet when one of my former colleagues, Evan Fox Decent, who is primarily a public lawyer, was asked to write a paper on the nature of equity with its supervisory jurisdiction over trusts and its willingness to control the holders of legal powers, his reaction was, this is all public law. <laughs> the truth, I think, is that acting for others does not belong either to private law or to public law. It does not belong either to the common law or to the civil law. Depending on how one defines the terms, I'm not even sure that mo the most distinctive part of it, the control of other regarding powers, belongs to either corrective justice or distributive justice. Evan Fox Decent, in the paper to which I just referred, has written of jurisdictional justice. On another view, one might argue that rightly acting for others calls for attention to the justice of stewardship. And as we scramble to find a way out of the emergency into which we have turned our planet, this kind of justice should never be far from our thoughts. Thank you.